All right. Welcome to this episode of the podcast. I am very fortunate to be joined by women's BBL player Abby Lowe. And firstly, I want to say thank you for getting, thank you for even responding to my DM because I had a, in my head, I was just thinking when I first DM'd you, I was like, there's a high chance she doesn't respond to this. I have to think they're probably in season right now. They're busy. <laughs> and just generally, it's like getting a random DM from someone you don't know is always a bit daunting. So I appreciate the time. <laughs> Well, it can be a bit daunting, but I always have time to talk about sports, so it's all good. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Um, first thing I want to talk about is, could you talk to me about your journey getting to the WBBL and just getting involved in basketball here in the UK? Yeah, of course. Um, so I actually first started playing when I was in, I grew up in France, so I started playing in France. But I came to the UK for under 15s, like the England camps. Um, my dad had heard about like the camps going on. So we did an exchange with one of my French teams and a st- team in Manchester. Um, so the two schools, like, well, the two teams, we just swapped and stayed at each other's houses. And it went so well. And the kids, like, I was 12 or 13 and we had so much fun. It was such a good experience. So from there, I kind of started going into... Um, all the national team camps and the summers with that so I was followed with under 15s then 16s and I moved back to England when I was 16 to go to Barking Abbey Academy in London and that's how I started to get involved in WBL so they have a they have like an academy where they bring in the some of the best players at that age group uh, in the country where we all train together every night and we have individuals during the day and one of the perks was that we got to play in the WBBL with obviously other professional players and it just improved our game so much. Um, so yeah, I did that for two years, went to America for college and I came back and I wanted to come back to the league. So I joined Newcastle. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> from what you've told me, it's basically this thing of you go to, you start off at a, a school that obviously prioritizes basketball and then it kind of just grows from there. So the better you do amongst your competition, the more camps you get invited to. Is that how it goes? Pretty much. I mean, if it's different within the UK and not all schools do um, basketball. I actually work at some schools and do like after school, after school basketball club. But there are, I think, like seven or eight specific um, schools in the UK that have like high level academies that players can go to. Right. And that's something I wanted to talk about because funnily enough, I watched my first BBL game last year live with one of my good friends. He <laughs> he currently works for the Sheffield Sharks, but we were in Huddersfield at the time because that's what we went for our undergrad. And he took me to the Manchester Giants game and they were playing Bristol last year. And when I was in there, I saw the crowd and everyone was so raucous and so behind it. And it got me it got me thinking, like, why is there not enough support behind this? And I also followed up with some of the players. I know Josh Steele has a YouTube channel and he's mentioned it. And one of the ways he thinks the British basketball league could be better, could be improved, is through better marketing and better connections with schools specifically. Because as you mentioned, there's only seven or eight, you know, elite level basketball like schools in the UK. So what more do you think could be done? I mean, yeah, I've seen that video from Josh. It's a really good video. He makes a load of good points. It is it is a market. It, the baseline for me is a marketing issue from time that for the first time ever, I've just seen in Manchester um, a big flyer announcing that there's actually the women's GB game going on. But normally, like around the streets, you never see anything about basketball advertised. Even if you look at sporting brands in the UK, they don't really talk about it. It's not often basketball on the front cover. You'll see football, you'll see... Um, maybe you would be but you won't see basketball and um, so I think it's starting from that we started to get new coverage on the news we started to get coverage of John Sky and on BBC so it's starting to grow and I've seen it grow over the past six seven years but we just need more of that coverage um, just so people are aware because once people find out like the fans love to go I know at Newcastle the men's team bring in a really big crowd um, and it sells out every weekend but it's been installed for a, a while now so that and the schools I'd say would be the second big point because I do so I teach PE as well in different schools and um, basketball is just not on the curriculum like people just aren't aware it's not introduced to you so if you're a child and you're not introduced to the sport why would you there's they they give them no reason to take an interest right because 
obviously I'm an avid basketball fan. Well, obviously you didn't know that I'm an avid basketball fan. I've followed <laughs> it since I was like 12. So for me growing up, it was very much, I was always kind of the unique kid that stood out because I liked basketball rather than football or rugby, which are the sports like at age 12 to 14, you're kind of just forced into as a boy. Yeah. And then even when you are, you know, taught basketball for like a term, it's honestly mind numbing how basic the drills can be. And it kind of make, it kind of takes the whole fun out of it for me. So in terms of specifically connecting with schools and making sure there's a better pipeline from, you know, regular secondary school to sports college to the league, how would you, how would you improve it? If you were in control of the WBBL, what would you do? Big ass. Um, <laughs> I would, I would force the teams to do outreach, outreach programs to the local schools the best example I've got that I've seen that works, uh, we're obviously not perfect, but it, it does work and it has brought attention, is at Newcastle, um, they do an outreach programme to schools called Hoops for Health. So they'll go into, I think it's primary schools, I'm not sure if they're doing a bit older now, but they'll basically go into the schools and we talk, we educate um, children on, obviously on health and wellness. So we talk about eating healthy and staying hydrated and those basic topics, but we also go over and play fun games and have a basketball session with them. And we talk to them about the sport, about the rules, about how you can get involved. And I think just that has brought so many um, children into the into the Saturday league and they really enjoy coming and playing now. So I think if every big club was forced to do that, not only on the men's, but also on the women's side, I think it would have a big impact. Cause I think a lot of the time kids just aren't aware that going and playing basketball is an option. And to be honest, it not always is not everywhere has a, a youth team or a, a youth academy that children can go and play at. Right. And specifically for the WBBL, which I think is even more underrepresented in comparison to the BBL, which even they have their struggles, <laughs> like specifically when it comes to connecting with young women and young girls and trying to get them to try out basketball and see if they like it. What would you do? Because I feel like that's a very unique issue because women in sports is either being pushed or it's not. It's very it feels like a very start stop topic unless there's something marketable behind it. People don't seem to want to get more girls involved so how would you genuinely try and get more girls involved in basketball well yeah i can do great um there's, there's two ways i mean again starting from the bottom i think when the players themselves like go into the schools it sets it gives the ch uh, the children the role model it gives someone to look up to it gives them someone to interact with and come to our games on the weekend um so we've had a few children like get really excited and it's really nice to see them after the game because they're so happy to just come and say hello to you and and then they go and start playing basketball and the other way would be to actually get um like more representation so it's, it's like so you see basketball represented not just in the schools and in like the basketball community but outside as well there's not a lot of famous basketball players in the UK that if you're if you're not in the basketball world I mean there's not a lot of people that you can turn around and say oh I know that player and that player if people aren't in basketball they don't have a clue yeah I I could I kind of get that because oftentimes when you think of basketball unfortunately you only think of what goes on in America and that's so far away and goes on so late that you can barely catch a game in the first place so <laughs> When it comes to the grassroots level, how like what were some of the difficulties of that? Like when you started off as a teenager, play, like playing regularly and having drills with, you know, high level basketball players around your age. What were some of the ups and downs of that? Well, I can relate back to directly when I was at the academy. So it was being around players that wanted to all. This is more of like once you get to like a more elite level but being around players that all want to get better or all, all want to improve all the time that's always a push because you're in an environment where everybody's constantly wanting to improve so that was always a big push and we got to play with um some a couple senior players who were really experienced and really like just had so much knowledge to share and give it away and they had a lot of patience because they knew they were coming into a team where that would be part of their role to be a leader so lead like following their example has been like was very inspiring for me and definitely pushed me to want to go further and go to America and then play professionally myself later on um so having those role models there was such a like had such a big impact right um 
now with content creation as athletes, because you mentioned the whole thing with the BBL that could help both the WBBL and the men's and the men's British Basketball League. You said marketing, and one of the points even Josh brought up was having social guys on social media and guys just explaining their story and kind of getting people into the sport through the storylines that can be better explained on the court. So with things like TikTok, how do you how do you use it to draw attention to only yourself but your team in basketball in general? I mean, I'm by no means a pro at it at all, but I'm all for if I can show what we what goes on in practice, what goes on during the games, some like little different life hacks that we have as like when we play basketball, just all the funny trends and things like that. I just think there's so many um, people on TikTok now that you can reach anybody that's even hinting to look at towards basketball, it'll reach them a lot quicker. So I thought, why not? Why not share? Why not tell people what you're up to when it comes to your sport and things like that? But I, on the flip side, people that I know a lot of players that wouldn't, I mean, they feel uncomfortable or they don't want to share everything. So it's it's a bit hit or miss. That's fair because yeah, it's understandable. I think even in, even in day to day life, you see it where some people, everyone uses social media so differently, and. I also and I also kind of understand why a lot of players try to market themselves because you recognize they recognize that hey the league needs more attention we have a great deal of talent around us so it's always about it's always about striking that balance but I do feel like the league in general be it the BBL or the WBBL does need to do a better job of just marketing the players on social media more generally and pushing those players who are more willing to do you know social media content like you could be the you could be the leading scorer of the team, but if you're not someone who's a big social media presence, that's fine. But the person who is, let's push them to the moon because those I feel like are the kind of people that get you invested. Because I watched Josh's video earlier this morning and I was I was immediately like intrigued by just how the whole league was structured. And that got me think that got me to think about well, what could be done. And that's kind of how I prepared for this interview in a way. So if you like if there was a young player, like a, a new player coming to the Newcastle Eagles on your team and they wanted to market themselves, how would you, what would you tell them? I'd tell them, don't worry about what other people are going to think because that's one of the main reasons people don't post videos. Um, stay honest, stay true to yourself. Like, I think people appreciate integrity on um especially on TikTok, just the appreciate tic, uh, the integrity of like feeling like it's a real story and things that are relatable. And then just, yeah, post content of you playing, post content of you, of your thoughts about practice, about, uh, about the games, about upcoming events, uh, about anything. Try and stick to your topic, I think helps. But other than that, free for all. Right. And this is probably gonna be one of my final questions. Um, when I was when I would go on TikTok because I have a little bit of following on there myself, um, I would I kind of got recommended these youth players or these young guys who would just be interested in basketball. And every day, and you see TikToks of them practicing or playing or just generally being kind of focused around the game. And that got me to think about the growth of the game in the UK. And then that also reminded me that we had this. I think with the California, it was like the California Classics team versus the Hoop Fix UK team, like in the summer just gone. So. Yeah. And they sold out one. They sold out like the arena in London, and and I it got me thinking. Just in terms of the basketball community in the UK in general, how much has that changed from when you started playing to where you are now? Like, what's the big change been? What's been big influencing factors in it for you? I think the biggest influencing factors that have helped the most have been outside people um, doing like put, doing putting media out there for um, for basketball in the UK because. Uh, so Hoops Fix had started not long ago. I, I'm not exactly sure when Hoops Fix started, but when I moved back to the UK, so ooh, like six, seven, oh my God, I want to say 10 years ago. That's horrible. About nine years ago, um, Hoops Fix would have just start would have would have just started. And the growth I've seen on Hoop like of Hoops Fix, which is one of the only media coverages for basketball in the UK has been huge and that's been followed by quite a lot of people that have been wanting to put media out and drawn more attention to the sport and I think while people keep doing that it keeps bringing more attention and it's gonna spiral eventually 
so that's the biggest change I've seen is actual people taking interest and putting out information. Like our games weren't even filmed all the time um, back then. Whereas now all the games are required to be on YouTube and they're required to have access to it. And all that's obviously, so I've seen that development. So I can see it moving forward. It's just, we need to keep going. Right. And on that point of UK basketball media, I did notice that there wasn't that much. Because if you go to like American high school games, for example, there's like a thousand and one different outlets covering these players. And most of those guys don't even really a lot of them unfortunately don't make it to the highest level of American basketball but then I thought about what the impact could be here if you just had a few more of those outlets around you'd have a lot more kids just generally invested in taking basketball more seriously even if they didn't want to make it to the professional level and yeah having platforms like a hoop fix I would have loved I would have loved to have known about them earlier when I was you know younger and I was desperate to play basketball at any moment I could had I known platforms like hoop fix were out, I would have taken it even, I would have been even more basketball crazy so, <clears throat> gosh, I need to think about, I need to actually think of my question now, damn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. So, with the WBBL, there's obviously, like, there's obviously a lot that goes on. And there's, according to Josh, there's like three tournaments in the men's game or three, like, trophies and such that they can win. And I found that a little, in, I found that a little interesting. So, I wondered... How does that all work? Because I'm used to, you know, you have a set of teams, you're playing for one trophy. How does it work with like three or like three or however many trophies you have in the WBBL? Right. Yeah. So you've got your, I think the men who may have one more than us. I'm not exactly sure, but I know for us. So we have our, we have our regular season trophy. Um, so whoever wins the league. And then we have our, obviously, we have playoffs at the end based on the turnout of the league. Within that season, we have a cup, which is a knockout round. And the final for that was last week, I believe, in Birmingham. They actually sold out the arena, which was really nice for the women as well. Um, and then they also have a trophy, which is another tournament, which I believe is a divide between North and South. And then we cross back it, you play your lo like the closest teams around you and then you go north south right <laughs> that is that does sound confusing when you put it like that i've been doing it for years so it just kind of <laughs> um but yeah i could see how that would be confusing to some people <laughs> a little bit but do you think like having a one tournament system if obviously it's probably done that way because of investments and whatever else have you but do you think having uh, one trophy system, like something more similar to the WNBA, for example, would that help or would that, how would that impact the league? I'm not sure how that would impact the league. I know as a player, the chance to be in different tournaments is really fun because you can make multiple finals and you don't. So if you like miss out on the, on the cup or on the cup, you can make the trophy or so it gives you like more chances to make a final, which is always like exciting for players. I don't think it's necessary. I think if it's going to confuse people, then maybe they need to like clear that up a little bit. But I don't think the actual concept of having a final and like running playoffs is bad for the league at all because finals and playoffs are what gets people excited. It's really easy to do media around them. So things like that side of it, I think is good. Right, so it's just kind of more opportunities for exposure and high levels of play. Fair enough. Um, okay, this will probably actually be my last question before I actually before I completely run out of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's do you have any horror stories from like anyone from when you were starting out? Because I remember that Josh referred to one time when he was when he was early on in his career. And it was raining because they had a, they were playing in like a converted warehouse, I think. And just be like, basically, there was wet spots all over the floor, and 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 the players just really didn't want to play. And they would have re they just his only goal at that point was just I need to survive this. So I was wondering if you had any of those kind of like funny stories and. <laughs> Oh, goodness. I do believe that that story was not based in the UK. It was when he was playing overseas. Um, so... That's a good <laughs> thing. That's a good thing. I haven't actually experienced that in England yet. Um, the one thing that I could say is the, the courts outside can 
often like the courts outside have often had like no they won't be like very well taken care of like a football field might be but there's actually a project in the UK called um, Project swish yeah project swish and they've been doing a really amazing job they've been basically going around um in the uk helping outside courts get funding to go and they've repainted all these courts and they've repainted them put new rims on um like it looks absolutely incredible what they've done and it's linked with basketball england um and anyone can go on the basketball england website sort of make talk to their council and get agreement and they help them refurbish all these courts so it's not a horror story, but it's a horror story turned good. That's a good thing. And we should end on a positive there. So <laughs> I would say thank you so much for giving me your time. And yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast. And I look forward to keeping up with your career and seeing how things go and just watching more of the BBL, honestly. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thanks for having me. I don't think I have all the answers, but I hope I gave you some. You gave me plenty. Thank you so much.